Welcome to ILTV's Insider, I'm Aaron Porras, and today Israel's Knesset has just advanced its latest economic stimulus package. But will it be enough? Joining us to discuss is Professor Naomi Feldman from the Department of Economics at Hebrew University and Professor Omer Moav from the Economics Department at the University of Warwick and the IDC. Now, as I said, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Finance Minister Katz's economic stimulus plan is moving forwards and the 6.5 billion shekel package offers 700 shekels for every Israeli adult, 2,000 shekels for couples with one child, 2,500 shekels for couples with two kids, and 3,000 shekels for couples with three kids. The plan also excludes high earners and offers extra support for those who qualify, like veterans, the handicapped, and Holocaust survivors. But as with many things, it seems to be one step forwards and two steps back, starting with how the money will be dispensed. יהיה מעבר, של, יהיה מעבר של כסף לכל הזכאים על בסיס החלטת הממשלה, זה לא יהיה ביום חמישי הקרוב, משום עובדה שקודם כל אנחנו מחכים להשלמת הליכי החקיקה בכנסת ישראל. רק לאחר שהחקיקה תסתיים נוכל לבצע את המוטל עלינו, אבל מהרגע שנקבל את האור הירוק, אנחנו מיד נתחיל להעביר את הכספים. הם לא יהיו במכה אחת לכולם, זה יהיה בפעימות, מה? זה יהיה בטווח של ימים ברצף. בהתחלה אנחנו נעביר את הכספים עבור הילדים, לאלה שמקבלים דרך קבע את קצבת הילדים, ולאחר מכן לשאר הסקטורים. מדובר בפרויקט שלמיטב ידיעתי מעולם לא היה בהיקף שכזה, בזמן שכזה, במדינת ישראל. פרופסור מואב, is this the best plan for Israel? Oh, that's a horrible plan. That's just, it makes zero economics, well, almost zero economic sense. I think there's a very broad consensus among economists, excluding the ones that uh, Netanyahu chose to advise him. And I think he chose advisors based on their agreement with this plan that makes very little sense. I mean, what's the goal of the plan? To stimulus, to, to provide a stimulus to the economy now, when we are, uh, when the economy doesn't function because uh, businesses are closed by uh, command, uh, because people are hesitating to uh, go out and do normal activities because of the COVID-19 virus. So at the moment, it seems to me like just Netanyahu acting just in, because he's thinking of the elections. And that's the only rationale. So to stimulate the economy at this point makes no sense. And to pour money, public money, it's debt that we will all have to pay in taxes in the future uh, for many years. And why give it to people that were not harmed at all? That makes no sense at all. All right, now, Professor Feldman, you are actually one of the advisors who helped Prime Minister Netanyahu and his team kind of come to this conclusion. So same question to you, is this the best plan for Israelis? So I would break that question into two parts. The first part is whether giving one-time grants is actually beneficial to the economy. And then the second part of that question would be, is should we make them universal? Should we give them to everyone? So giving one-time grants is not anything new. Um, the United States has given grants like this in the past in previous recessionary periods. Um, during this, also during this corona crisis, um, Japan has given a universal grant. South Korea has also given a universal grant to each of its citizens. So the idea behind these grants is generally to stimulate the economy. Okay, so people are going to get this money and they're going to go out and spend it according to the government. So I agree with Omer 100% that if you give a grant like this, during a period where the economy is shut down, 100% no, it is not the, po the best possible way to spend the money. Um, however, it is a legitimate fiscal tool when the government does want to stimulate. So when the economy is open, um, the government can give these one-time grants. Again, you're going to see across the distribution of incomes, you're going to see differential responses. So at the lower end of the distribution, where people tend to be a little bit more liquidity constrained, that is, they live month to month, um, you can get close to 100% of these grants being spent. At the higher end of the distribution, where people have more savings, you get very low um, spending out of these grants. So, for example, in previous uh, recessionary periods in the United States, roughly 20 to 30 percent of these one-time grants were spent. Um, in research that's come out now in the United States with these grants um, that were $1,200 per person up to $3,400 per household in the U.S., you have people spending roughly, on average, about 50 cents on the dollar. Now, again, it's going to differ across the distribution. 
So as a fiscal tool, it can be beneficial. Um, it doesn't achieve 100%, but people have free will with how to use this money. They can go out and spend it, or they can use it to well, save. All right, well, well I'd, like, I'd, like to, question. I'd like to press you on that a little bit because you know, we're okay. talking about on the higher end of, of you know, earners who maybe don't necessarily need this, and we'll come back to that. Like you said, there, there may be less uh, needing of this, of this grant, but then on the lower end, you have people who, some, some of whom have been out of work for months, and this is a one-time grant of between you know, 7, 700 and two, 3,000 shekels. Is that going to be enough, this one-off grant of a few hundred shekels, really, to sustain some of these struggling Israelis? No, of course not. It's not meant to sustain them long term. It's meant to give them a little bit of a breathing room. And again, when we're talking about these grants, it's not necessarily should be according to income. What you want to do, ultimately, if we could sort of figure out and really tailor a specific grant to every single household based upon the damage done to them um, under this corona crisis, then I agree 100%. That would probably be the best way to approach it. And What's very unique about this particular crisis is that the damage has been much more widespread. I just read, in fact, today, a survey that shows that 55% of Israelis um, are fearful of even being able to pay their bills next month. So again, this particular crisis has really hit many more elements of, uh, of society than would typically be hurt um, in a typical sort of standard recessionary uh, period. Um, so I agree 100% that, um, that yes, you're going to have, diff you know, pe again, you're going to have people at the lower end of the distribution not getting enough money. You're going to have people at the higher end of the distribution perhaps getting money that they don't necessarily need. But the way I see it is that because we really can't tailor, right? There's, there's obviously some people who are hurting, oh. and there's some people who are not hurting. But it's the people in the middle that we can't necessarily observe. You know, someone who, for example, their salary was, was reduced two-thirds, who perhaps might be working. Um, should we measure this at the household level? Should we measure at the individual level? Should we take into account savings? So really measuring what do we mean by need is very difficult to do. And so as far as I'm concerned, you know, perhaps out of this six billion we're wasting maybe a billion, maybe two billion, you know, in a $1.3 trillion economy. Mm. If that's the price we have to pay such that we can help people that actually need it and help them very, very quickly, then I say it's worth paying that. All right, Professor Moav, you know, what's your response? And do you maybe have a, a plan that you believe would have been better? Yeah, well, first we need to remember that this six and a half billion uh, shekel plan is just part of a much larger scale plans that were implemented. Uh, more than 100 billion, there's a debate on the scale of these plans. Uh, and this plan is just, yeah, seriously, to talk about stimulating the economy. So it's really two parts, stimulating the economy, which makes zero sense at this point of time, maybe in the future, but it's wasting the opportunity. These six and a half billion shekels will not be there next time. I mean, again, there's no money. It's all government bonds. The government is bor borrowing money that we will need to pay in the future. So at this point of time, it makes zero sense. In addition, the comparison to the US also doesn't make any sense to me because Israel is a small open economy and a lot of what people spend the money is just import. So that doesn't stimulate the economy. So we're stimulating the Chinese economy now. Very nice. Uh, in addition to that, even if people really spend the money, there's a cost. And the cost is that in the general macro equilibrium, that could reduce investment, private investment, and could hard, harm the, uh, the deficit in the uh, surplus of exporting. Because there is some general equilibrium, unless there is some belief that the multiplier would be more than at least one. But in that kind of recession, it makes no sense. And for the sake of perspective, the whole idea of let's see what others do and just copy it. In 2008, there was the world crisis, was financial the crisis. crisis. And in 2009, uh, Yuval Steinitz was the Minister of Finance. I was his economic, senior economic advisor. And we went against the world. We didn't spend money. We didn't pour money to stimulate the economy. And guess which country did much better than the average OECD countries? Israel. So we went against but the was world. But was Israel in the same position as, say, the United States after well, the 2008 crisis? No, because no. No. However, this example shows you that despite huge pressure 
spend money. That's the time to, pre to spend money and stimulate the economy. We didn't follow this advice. And it was successful. So how, so and now, how, what actually, would you it tell, makes less sense. It makes less sense So now. how? what would you tell Netanyahu to have done? What would you have done? Well, I think that the main thing should be help people who suffered from the crisis and need the help to survive. And That's how, the only thing to do. Well, but some, need, but some, instead of being lazy and not thinking about the problem, and this is what happened. Let's talk about the process well, of but, decision making. Well, but hold on, because now you're saying that Professor Feldman is basically not either too lazy, it sounds like... No, 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 said. not Professor Feldman. No. no, no, no. No. Let me clarify. Okay. I have a lot... I really appreciate Professor Feldman as an economist, as a labor economist. So how, so how would I'm, you divide between the people who need and the people who don't? Because she's saying that, well, you know, if you decide, with, a, with a billion I mean, or two have, of waste... But that's just, it. as you said correctly, this small program is a huge waste of money and it might help a few people who fell between the chairs. But what the government needs to do is to work. And the prime minister, the way he worked, just think of the process of the decision making. Mm -hmm. Zero consulting with the central bank, which legally is the economic advisor of the government. Zero consulting with the Ministry of Finance. It's basically Netanyahu and Avi Simchon, Professor Simchon, that somehow decided something that serves Netanyahu politically. And then they found Nomi, Nomi Feldman and uh, well, Professor Uri Hefetz, who, so, who agree with it. So I want to They are her... just posters. All right, Professor, Professor Feldman, uh, your response. So, so I would agree with that 100%. I mean, again, I, I'm really not sort of an insider in any of the political decision-making that happens. Um, I'm just looking at this from the outside, and I agree 100%. There should be, you know, there should be consul consultations across all elements of the government to work together. I, I completely uh, agree with that 100%. Um, again, I don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And, and, and again, I wish we were having these discussions actually back in March. I think if, if we were having them back then... Uh, we'd be doing this under the sort of the, the, the rushedness and sort of the pressure that we seem to be doing things now. Um, and, and then we would have been doing it under a very different scenario. I think initially in the beginning, you know, we thought that this was going to be one or two months, and then life would go back to normal. And I think we're realizing now that this, we're really in for the long haul. And so the decisions that were made in many countries back in March were really meant to, for example, you know, keep workers attached to their jobs, was to increase unemployment insurance, make it much more easier for people to, to apply and to receive unemployment. And so now we're sitting here in July. We've actually learned a lot more. And so we should be using what we've learned from other countries and what we expect the future now to bring to actually build solid economic um, policies for, for Israel. Um, yeah. All right, well, Professor Feldman, I, I want to stay with you for just a moment because, you know, this plan is provisional sure. on the unemployment rate, but that, uh, that rate actually differs depending on who you ask. You have the National Insurance Institute, you have uh, the Central Bureau of Statistics. You know, so who's, whose unemployment rate are we referring to here? Because that's a range of, you know, 11% unemployment to 21%. Um, so they should decide who's unemployment. I mean, again, we might have a lot of discouraged workers who are actually just going to leave the labor force. And so do we want to take them into account? Probably yes. I mean, we'd, you know, again, they're not going to be perhaps officially in um, the unemployment numbers. But I would imagine that they're going to be a large segment of people who just kind of have given up and are sort of waiting this out, perhaps. Um, and so, again, I think whatever number they decide should be taking into account these workers, and it should um, have uniform sort of consensus on it. So people aren't bickering over, you know, this number or that number. Professor Moab? Well, I fully agree with uh, Professor Feldman that the government should have done uh, plans in bark back in March, but you could follow the government, not just on the economic side, but also on the fighting the pandemic side. It seems as if the things is not, are not managed. Netanyahu is occupied with many other things, his personal issues, and the decisions are always, uh, you know, very quick from today to today. Uh, restaurants are closed suddenly after they buy all the fresh groceries. Just really just ignoring the misery of people, just spending money in a populist way. And let's remember that the six and a half billion shekels, this is the small money. You talked about the un unemployment benefits. That's another horrible plan because to 
promised people for one year unemployment benefits conditional on not being employed. That's really a dumb, that's just stupidity. I mean, one could be generous, equally generous, even more, and tell people, yeah, you have the unemployment benefit, but if you find a job which doesn't pay as much as your previous job, you could work, and you do not lose all your unemployment benefit. So we already see that there is actually... You're saying you're stimulating a, a welfare state. Of course. What they are doing now, it's just these are crazy plans. We already observe, alongside extremely high unemployment, employers trying to find workers and fail because many people who have the skills refuse to work because they have the, the program that provides them with income for a year. And if they work, they lose this income. So there could be smarter things to do. Also on the other huge, and these are the huge programs. It's not the six and a half billion. Let's remember, six and a half billion shekels is a lot of money. That's a, an average of 30,000 shekels per family in Israel, just this, no, 3,000 shekels, just this tiny amount of 6 billion, about 3,000 shekels per household in Israel, the cost, the taxes we will need to pay in the future. And the most bothering thing is that, as Professor Feldman said, this is going to be probably a very long crisis. The government should behave in a responsible way. Keep the resources, the ability to borrow and help people, because you might find yourself without the ability to help people in two years' time when you're spending in a way that is just completely unresponsible at the moment. Professor Feldman, you know, how do you respond to allegations that, that this plan is helping to produce a welfare state in Israel? So listen, I, I, I can understand, listen, this is the classic problem with unemployment insurance, right? Um, that it creates disincentives to actually find a job. Um, and this is, you know, a classic question in economics, you know, what is the impact of increasing unemployment insurance benefits on sort of longevity on unemployment? The evidence is a little bit mixed, but there definitely um, are some disincentives to going out and finding a job uh, for people who kind of are, are on the margin like that. Um, whether it should be for a whole year, again, the positive side to this is that you're giving some people some security. There's a lot of anxiety right now, and it's probably clear, you know, we're going to be in this until we find a vaccine, until we have herd immunity, or until something else happens. And so at this point, you know, I think, again, a couple of months ago, if you would have said we're going to be, you know, dealing with this, with our economic policies for another year and a half, we probably would have thought that was a little ridiculous. It doesn't sound so ridiculous to me anymore. And so, again, giving people some security, I can understand that, and I don't think that's bad. On the other side, uh, a year is a long time, and as we see, things change quite quickly. A policy that might have been good a, you know, a month ago is no longer perhaps a good idea. And so I would have been more inclined to say, okay, let's take this through the end of the year, let's reevaluate, and then maybe take things on, on a quarterly basis. Um, but I, again, I can understand, you know, unemployment does not, you know, replace um, salaries completely. On the lower end, I think it approaches somewhere 50, perhaps to 70 percent, and that's probably where you're going to see most of the disincentives happening. Um, but again, with unemployment so high right now, you know, over 20 percent, uh, I would suspect that, it, again, at the low end of the distribution, you might have some of the problems, but probably anyone who wants a job is going to be able to find a job right now. Um, well, the problem is that people don't want to find a job, and actually the problem is not the lower end. These are people who had average high salaries, and now they have the unemployment benefit, which is indeed much lower than their salary. But the employment opportunities that they face are not as attractive as their previous uh, salary. And that's, these are exactly the people that are somewhat skilled, but, and as a result, they and we see the evidence how, now. There's how, more and more evidence that no, but how, many, but how many people are actually saying, "I'd rather be on welfare than work"? Oh, many, of course. People who are look. If you get seven thousand shekels a month without working, your previous salary was perhaps twelve thousand. But now your That's opportunity. That's barely enough to live. Seven thousand. I know, shekels but if you are but if you're offered a job which is eight thousand, would you work? Most people say no. Many people say no. They could actually stay home and save money by staying home, for instance, taking care of their children. And we see the evidence for that starting to rise. Uh, and as I said, and 
I'm happy that Professor Feldman agrees with me. To commit for one year is just not the wise way. In addition, not to create, to add the incentive I proposed. So again, what you saw when the decision-making process, also this program was just decided by Netanyahu and Avi Simchon, and without consulting Treasury, without consulting the Bank of Israel, a decision that was done from today to tomorrow, and that's why they make all the mistakes. Professor Feldman, final comments? Again, I would, I would say that, you know, okay, so maybe that if, you know, you're making 7,000 unemployment and you're going, you know, you would turn down a job for 8,000, but the person who's making 3,000 unemployment will take that 8,000 uh, shekel a month job. So again, it's not clear to me that um, we ne that's necessarily the marginal worker that we're, we're interested in. Somebody will take that job. And again, what you really need is en masse people not taking jobs. Because again, once the unemployment rate gets below 10%, these benefits are going to, to decrease to 75%. So you would really need a significant part of the population refusing to take jobs, which it's not clear to me that, that that's the case. And it's, very, it's myopic thinking. It's thinking, you know, really in the short run for longer run, you know, investment in human capital and, and other things like that. So, but, right. I, but I understand. Yeah. I, I mean, again, we understand the criticism, uh, you know, that unemployment is a disincentive for for labor force participation. Right, well, well, these are very scary times, very confusing <laughs> times, I think, for everybody. Unfortunately, though, that is all the time that we have today to discuss it. Thank you again, Professor Naomi Feldman and Professor Moab, Omer Moab for joining us. Tune in next week on Insider for more in-depth analysis on everything Israel. And also, if there's a topic that you want us to cover next, please let us know in the comment sections online. Finally, remember that for more news from Israel, follow ILTV on Facebook, like us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV channels. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.